Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for FCI Live, our summer 2023 series. We are into our second week. So much content this week. And you might have actually noticed in this series, our summer 2023 series, we're really talking a good deal. There's three different uh, sessions that are specific to either rural grocery or a case study from rural grocery. And that's because a lot of really innov interesting, innovative stuff is happening in rural grocery. And I'm very excited. I'll introduce a minute, Erica Blair, who is here to join us to talk in more depth about what is going on with rural grocery and so much of the innovation and the challenges that they are facing. Before we do that, of course, our quick our quick how bit of housekeeping everyone knows, as I ask if you've ever come to these before, that you do make sure you're muted and stay muted throughout the session, unless the speaker specifically asks you to unmute. This is because we're requiring we're recording and we want the sound quality to be excellent for that. And when people unmute, it can change that sound quality. So we really appreciate it if you stay muted. And of course. The question that we get asked the most, which is, where am I going to find these recordings? Are you recording? Do I get a copy of the recording? The answer is yes. We record all of our FCI live sessions and we put them out on the FCI YouTube page, Food Co-op Initiative YouTube. Um, and that will be on the afternoon of July 3rd. They will be available. We put them all up at once. And if you have registered for any of our sessions for this FCI live series, you will receive an email as soon as they go up telling you they're up and with links showing you where you can find those videos. So indeed, they will be available to you. Real quickly, we want to thank our FCI Live champion sponsor for our summer 2023 series, the National Co-op Grocers. Thanks to them for making this series possible. All right. And then without further ado, we're going to get into discussing what you're actually here to talk about, not listening to me, which is we have Erica Blair from the Rural Grocery Initiative with us to talk about the unique challenges and innovations that are coming out of rural grocery right now. So much interesting stuff going on and so excited to have you here. Thank you, Erica. All right. Thank you, JQ. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you all so much for, for joining today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my slides here. Um, okay, can you all see it? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, what we're going to talk about today, as you can tell from this, um, from the title of this presentation, we're going to talk about just uh, some of the challenges that rural communities are facing in keeping their grocery stores alive, as well as some of the creative models and creative partnerships that we've seen um, in rural communities. Um, you know, we've been seeing that more and more rural communities are taking an active role um, in ensuring that food access is available. Um, so I'm hoping that through this presentation today, you might be able to take some of the, these ideas home with you and use them within your own context. Um, obviously, a lot of the examples are not going to be applicable in every single community because all communities are different. Um, but hopefully this just helps spur some ideas. Um, so this is kind of what, what the uh, session today is gonna look like. Um, first, just kind of laying the groundwork, what are some of those challenges? that rural grocers are facing. Um, talk about some of those creative partnerships that we're seeing. And a lot of these examples will be coming from Kansas because that's where I'm based. Um, I know that there's a lot of other innovation happening elsewhere in the country though as well. Um, and then we'll have time at the end, hopefully for some questions and just reflections. So there's gonna be a ton of information <laughs> today thrown at you. But I will kind of pause throughout the throughout the session today to see what questions um, uh, or what comments have been coming up. So, challenges in rural grocery. Um, before I I get into that though, um, I did just want to kind of hold on one sec here. Um, I did just want to kind of set the stage and. Um, you know, share a little bit of, of uh, who the Rural Grocery Initiative is um, and why we are involved in this work. 
So um, back in 2006, um, there was a unit at Kansas State University that was conducting listening sessions across Kansas to understand the needs and challenges of rural communities. And time and time again, from those listening sessions, there was a, a concern about the viability of local grocery stores, concerned that these stores were facing tremendous uphill battles, um, and it was becoming harder for these stores to remain viable. So RGI started in 2007 um, uh, to try to help sustain those stores, help overcome some of those challenges that they face. Um, and we work with stores not only in Kansas, but across the country as well. So we provide technical assistance, meaning we provide information and resources. We're helping make connections, um, helping strategize with existing grocers, as well as communities that want to open grocery stores. We have a, a rural grocery toolkit with a bunch of great resources for um, new and existing grocers. We conduct research to try to understand the rural grocery landscape um, and what additional support is needed. Host educational events, so workshops, webinars. We host a, a, a summit, national summit, every other year. Um, and we're also a partner with the Kansas Healthy Food Initiative, which provides loans and grants to healthy food retail in Kansas. So that's just kind of a quick snapshot of what we do. And the reason that we do all of this is because we really consider grocery stores to be anchor institutions in rural communities. So when a grocery store closes, it can really be an existential issue in rural communities. Um, it can really spell trouble for other businesses in town. So it uh, has this ripple effect throughout the community. And, you know, I know I don't need to persuade anyone on the call why grocery stores are important, um, but it's really, I think, hard to overstate the importance of rural grocery, uh, for, of grocery uh, stores in rural communities, um, because they provide these really three uh, critical three benefits, including economic benefits, public health benefits, and community gathering space. So in terms of economic benefits, um, these first two bullet points here are specific to Kansas, contributing $644,000 to the local economy, providing jobs, um, six, you know, 17 local jobs on average, six full-time, 11 part-time, capturing SNAP and WIC benefits to provide economic stimulus, their resilience businesses during economic downturns. And they also are helping to keep dollars recirculating through the community, keeping um, profits in the community. So all of that and more, if you wanna, if you wanna read more on, on those stats, um, I encourage you to check out our, our fact sheet there, the benefits of hometown groceries. Um, which the Rural Grocery Initiative um, has on our website. Term, in terms of health benefits, you know, they, they have a greater variety of healthy food than convenience store counterparts, and they stock them at lower prices than convenience stores. Um, there's also just plenty of research showing the connection between food access and health outcomes. So they are a, you know, a, a determinant of social determinant of, determinant of health. Um, there's plenty of research showing that that relationship. Um, and then we also see that rural grocery stores are often um, providing access to locally produced food as well. Um, it can be for small producers, it can be a challenge to sell their products to some of the larger chain grocery stores. And um, that's just what we have heard and uh, what we've seen from our own experience. Um, selling to an independent grocery store can have a lot fewer barriers um, to access that market. And then finally, um, you know, rural grocery stores are providing these um, community gathering spaces and helping to create community identity. Um, they are often some of the 
few places in town in rural communities where people can come together. They have an area where they can gather and connect. Um, we've seen grocery stores with cafes and uh, meeting space for clubs or even art galleries, um, you know, using their walls as, as a space for art. Um, there's even a, a grocery store in Kansas that has a monthly music night. So they are providing these roles that wouldn't you might not necessarily expect, um, but it all kind of helps create that um, sense of social cohesion. So, um, you know, all of that, um, again, that's why, um, going back to why the Rural Grocery Initiative was formed, those are the benefits that communities want to keep in town. Um, but as I'm sure you are all well aware, this is a very tough industry and um, these stores are struggling to stay in business. Um, so on this slide, you can see that during a 10 year period, the Rural Grocery Initiative was tracking grocery store closures. Um, and between 2008 and 2018, one in five grocery stores in rural Kansas closed. Um, some of those stores have reopened since then, but I think it just helps paint that picture of how tenuous it can be. Of course, there are high operating costs, slim profit margins. Um, you know, it's hard to compete with the um, prices that chain supermarkets have uh, just because they can get better deals on their products than small locally owned stores. Um, so again, challenges that you see playing out across the country. Um, some challenges that I wanted to highlight today that I think are particularly salient in rural communities, not that they aren't elsewhere as well, but these are just some things that we hear about a lot in our office. Um, those challenges include population decline, distribution, competition with dollar stores, and transition planning. Um, so population decline, you know, the general trend across the country is that rural places are losing population. So on this slide, out of 105 counties in Kansas, um, 80 have lost population according to the last census. Um, again, the trend is not just unique to Kansas, it's nationwide. People are leaving communities for other opportunities elsewhere. Um, and that just means there's less purchasing power to support these businesses. Um, another challenge is distribution. So, um, uh, you know, with grocery stores, their wholesalers may uh, impose a minimum buying requirement. So in other words, the grocery store um, needs to purchase a certain amount of product every week, a certain amount of goods every week um, in order to work with that distributor. And if they can't meet that minimum because they don't need to stock that much, they don't need that much to support their community, um, then that distributor is just not going to work with that store. So we've seen grocers getting creative here where nearby grocers might combine their orders together to meet the minimum, or even unfortunately, sometimes um, picking up their supplies from competitors like Sam's Club to stock their shelves. Um, competition with dollar stores. Um, you know, we are seeing a proliferation of dollar stores in rural communities. Um, this article really highlights that. Um, here is the owner of Haven Food Liner quoted as saying that when a dollar store opened in his community, their store lost about 35 to 40 percent of their sales. Um, and from what I've read, what I've heard other grocers say is that that's pretty pretty standard. Um, sounds like that's not uncommon to see a drop like that. And, you know, with profit margins already so slim, that can just be the tipping point for them to close their doors. Um, 
I also want to say the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, uh, that's an organization that I encourage you all to check out. They've been doing a lot of really good research on dollar stores if you're if you're interested in, in learning more about that. Um, here's another study that the USDA Economic Research Service did in 2021, um, basically showing that um, rural counties are losing grocery stores while they are gaining other types of food retailers, in particular super centers and dollar stores. So you can see that increase in the graph. Um, dollar super centers, the number of super centers are going up, the number of dollar stores are going up, while the number of grocery stores are declining. So um, yeah, not, <laughs> not great, not great. Um, um, for the state of rural grocery right now. Um, another challenge that we see, that we hear about a lot, that we've um, been doing a lot of programming on recently is, is transition planning. So this is the idea that when a grocer is ready to move on from the business, they're ready to retire or move on for whatever reason, who is going to be taking over the business and making sure that it continues? Um, who's going to be purchasing the store. Um, these transition plans, while, while a transition is inev inevitable for, for any business, we've found that it is quite difficult to create these transition plans um, for a variety of reasons. Um, the Small Business Development Center recommends starting a transition plan well in advance of when a transition will take place. Um, they recommend three to five years. Um, uh, unfortunately, in our office, sometimes we're getting a call and we're hearing, oh, the store is gonna close in a couple of months and they, they haven't lined up a, a buyer. So what are, we, what are we gonna do about that? So unfortunately, a lot of times when that happens, the store will close and suddenly the community is left without a grocery store. Um, so uh, in 2021, our office conducted a survey of rural grocers in Kansas, um, and we found that about 80% of grocers in, uh, rural grocers in Kansas did not have a transition plan in place. Um, again, and this is not just to um, call out, you know, grocers in Kansas, Making transition plans is um, you can you can see studies from across the country that that it's just a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge across the board. Um, this slide here is really interesting. I think that this data is just kind of interesting to take a look at. If you go to Project Equity, their website, um, they have this interactive map where you can see how many businesses in your state are owned by baby boomers, by people who are nearing retirement. Um, and it just helps highlight, helps illustrate that this transition is, we're in the midst of a very large transition right now. So we need to be thinking about those, um, who's gonna be taking over. Um, and Project Equity, by the way, is an organization that's really focused on worker cooperatives. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. So, you know, with all of those challenges, um, uh, with how difficult the grocery industry is, that's just contributing to food access challenges across the country. This is a, a map of Kansas. And as you can see, the purple shaded census tracts in Kansas are considered low access by USDA. So that's a lot of the state. Um, most of these communities are rural. And so, you know, people are ending up sometimes driving 30 or 40 miles round trip just to get groceries. So it's a, it's a big issue. Um, so sorry to start this presentation today with <laughs> so much doom and gloom, but I did think it was important to kind of, again, set the stage on why is it challenging? Why is rural grocery challenging? What are the issues? 
that we're facing because that leads up to the innovative solutions that we're going to talk about next. So right now I just pause. I know I've been talking for, for a few minutes now um, to see if there are any questions or any comments in the chat. Or, or if not, feel free to chime in now. Um, We definitely have people chiming in and saying they're from rural communities <laughs> mm -hmm. themselves. I have a question. Sure. Or a comment. Um, so I'm 65 years old. I grew up in the grocery business. My career was as a, um, I ran my own mom and pop pharmacy. Would you say that one of your challenges is how to get the younger generation to understand what a community gathering space is for a grocery store? A lot of them have grown up um picking up outside walmart and i'm not picking on walmart or target or any of the big box stores or they're getting it from amazon they're getting it online would you say that one of the bigger challenges is trying to get the younger generation to understand that they can go to a grocery store and actually talk to people have some kind of social <laughs> life <clears throat> you know um it's interesting that you say that because i have heard from uh some community supported grocery stores saying that they're they do have a harder time getting some some of the younger people in town coming into the store because of what you just said you know there's all of these other options available like like Amazon um, that are supposedly more convenient um, and they're missing out on um, getting into the store and supporting a local business um, so yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that assessment that that's that can be a challenge for sure. So what is so the question here, another question, what specific size of store or co-op is our focus of today's discussion? Um, well, I will say that a lot of the stores that we're talking about today are in communities of a um, thousand people or less. So it's going to be quite small, <laughs> uh, pretty small communities that we're talking about here. Good question. All right. Well, I think, um, I think we'll go ahead and move on then right now. Um, you know, to talk about what are some of the things that communities are doing to com combat these challenges. Um, you know, we've kind of laid out that it's really challenging to keep a grocery store alive, but it's also really, really important to keep these grocery stores in town. So we are seeing a lot more creative thinking and more creative partnerships with other organizations and other entities that want to maintain these amenities in their communities. Um, so, you know, when, when the traditional model of having a single independent operator isn't feasible for a community, what are some other options? Um, so, yeah, how are communities reimagining who gets to be involved in making sure residents have access to healthy food? Um, so, so next we're gonna talk through um, what we're seeing in Kansas in terms of creative community partnerships. Um, we'll talk, we'll, we'll take a look at school-owned grocery stores, nonprofit grocery stores, different types of public-private partnerships, municipally owned stores, and of course, very briefly, I'll talk talk about cooperatives too. Um, so this is gonna be pretty high level. Um, just to kind of give you a feel for what these different models entail and give you some examples. Um, and again, hopefully this spurs some ideas, even if these models are not exactly repli replicable in your community, hopefully it gives you ideas for different partnerships that you could have, that you could form. Um, okay, so the first example is a school-owned store um, Blue Stem Mercantile in Leon, Kansas. So Leon has a population of about 670 people. Um, the Blue Stem School District has um, 
two schools. It has an elementary school and a high school. And the high school for the past 10 years had had an entrepreneurship class. And so the class over the years had different projects. They sold candy, they sold coffee in the school library. Um, the entrepreneurship students were learning about business planning. They were getting hands-on experience. And this really spurred an idea from this, uh, the superintendent, Joel Lovesey, who was interested in seeing this go even further and having the students open a business downtown. Um, so in 2019, the old grocery store building went up for sale. And so the superintendent saw this as an opportunity and he approached the school board about purchasing this building and opening a grocery store, which would fill a community need because the community did not have a grocery store at that time. Um, and the nearest one was at least 15 miles away from the community. So, um, the school board in the past had assisted with startup costs for these kinds of projects. So there was precedent for getting some initial support, some initial funding. Um, they went ahead and purchased the building um, with the understanding that the grocery store sales would cover the costs of operating the store. So the store opened in 2020. March 2020. <laughs> so it was really just immediately apparent how important it was to have a grocery store in town, having food access in town, since a lot of the residents at that time wanted to stay in town, didn't want to leave to go to the larger cities farther away um, during the, the height of the pandemic. So, um, so really a key player here, of course, with this model is the school district. So they own the property, the business, the building, the inventory. Um, and then this model has some unique benefits as well. So the store doesn't um, have to be so focused on making a profit. It really wants to cover its expenses. And, and part of that is because of the educational mission of the school. Um, you know, there are classes being taught here at the store. Um, the entrepreneurship students are learning about operating a business. Agricultural students are selling products, meat and eggs to the store. Um, the tables that you see here in this photo were created by the shop class. And kind of another interesting benefit with this model is that um, it helps connect the younger generation in town with other residents. So even if community members in town don't have school-aged children, they can still go to the store, gather, um, and connect with the school and its students. So it has kind of an interesting um, social cohesion benefit there. Um, and uh, there's another school-owned store that I know of in Cody, Nebraska. Um, but I don't know too many others. So if anybody else on the call today does know of another example, I would love to hear it. Um, so this is the interior of the store. As you can see, it is not a full service grocery store. Um, really what they wanna do is provide some staples um, and provide things that you know people might need to make dinner that evening. So the next example of a community-supported store that I'll talk about today is the nonprofit grocery store. So with this model, there's an organization that is involved in all aspects of the store. So it could be an existing organization or a foundation. It could be a brand new organization that forms just for this purpose. So these stores are mission-driven. There's organizational involvement. They can receive volunteer support from the community, donations to help subsidize the business. Um, and then the, the grocery store may also have access to grants that another for-profit for business might not have access to. Um, so we have a couple examples of this here in Kansas that I'll talk about, Moreland Mercantile and Grand Avenue Market in Plains. Um, 
So Moreland Mercantile. So in Moreland, there had been traditionally a store since 1915 um, on Main Street. But in 2006, the store owner wanted to retire and couldn't find a successor. The store closed and it sat empty for about seven years. And so during that time, residents were having to drive a minimum of 25 miles round trip to get their groceries. Um, so a need was identified in the community that they needed a, a grocery store again. Um, uh, and there wasn't really one, anyone in town that was willing to make that kind of investment on their own. So the Moreland Community Foundation stepped in and they were able to purchase the building from the previous owner. And to do that, they received several grants. They also received a community development block grant for renovation of the grocery store. Um, so here's an interior view of the grocery store. It has a really nice historic feel. They did a lot of renovation on this building, um, which was largely done by volunteers and the, um, and the board members. Um, initially for the first year or so, I think the store was entirely run by volunteers, um, but now they have been able to create three jobs here at the store. So this store opened in 2013. Um, the next example of a nonprofit grocery store is Grand Avenue Market in Plains. This store opened in 2021. Um, and this store was a, a very, very long project. It took about 10 years to get this one open. Um, so uh, so this, the community lost its store in 2001. In 2008, a grocery store committee was appointed by the Plain City Council, and they began doing research. They even went to Moreland Mercantile to do some research. And in 2012, a 501c3 was formed with the specific goal of opening a grocery store as part of its mission, part of a, a core part of its mission. So they spearheaded everything. They, you know, they did the fundraising efforts, received grants, they conducted market studies and feasibility studies, gathered community input, hired employees. So they were very much involved in every aspect of opening the store, very much like a co-op. Um, so yeah, as I said, this store was about 10 years in the making. So it took a lot of dedication and commitment from people uh, in the community. And so it's just very exciting for, for them to, to have this beautiful grocery store now. Um, the next model is uh, what we would call a public-private partnership. Well, and maybe um, maybe I'll just pause for a moment since I just went through two models just to see if there were any comments, questions. There was a question about the Moreland market and if it actually pays rent or how, how that works. So Moreland Mercantile, um, the foundation owns the building. So my understanding is that there isn't a, any rent that's paid. Okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, Sherry, you say you have a question about nonprofits. Um, if you wanna unmute for a moment and, and share that. Yes, I am. Um, I just recently went through a process of um, setting up a nonprofit with 10 other volunteers for a racial justice group. And it is a huge undertaking. We've been um, going for two years and we're still, it feels like most of our volunteer hours are going into completing federal regulations and state regulations and that kind of thing, not into um, racial justice education. And so I'm just, I mean, it would be wonderful to get grants for a small rural grocery store, but I'm wondering are there ways to streamline that, or does the, uh, you know, National Co-op Initiative have, uh, um, you know, advisors to help with that process? Because we just kind of stumbled around. Well, um, I think that it's 
I think it's it was difficult for these stores as well to be recognized <laughs> as nonprofit grocery stores. Um, my understanding is it can be it can be tricky um, to really prove or convince the IRS that selling groceries is a charitable mission. I don't know if that's really um, uh, anything that you're running into in your situation, but um, I do, I will just say that it was tricky for them as well to get set up. Um, I think with Moreland Mercantile, I don't know if they technically call it a grocery store even just because of the rules and you know there's weird rules <laughs> with this kind of thing so I think they call it um like a healthy food outlet maybe is what they the term they use but um so yeah I I don't know if that answers your question but <laughs> well it's great to know that there are places that are doing it and maybe we'll contact them to see if mm -hmm. they'll talk to us about it thank you yeah I did want to throw in that also that those who are organizing as food co-ops often get these nonprofit grants as well. And they do that by partnering with a nonprofit organization that works as an umbrella. So they're meeting the same mission. So you Great don't idea. have to be a nonprofit to get access to all these grants. Some grants, absolutely, but it's more and more so um, this partnership process works really well for a lot of startup food co-ops as well, if you can't actually incorporate as a nonprofit. Okay. Well, um, let's take a look at those next models then. So the public-private partnership. Um, so with this model, there are two entities working together. So the public entity could be a municipal government, like the city or the county, or another local institution, found, community foundation, school. Um, and then the private entity would be the independent business owner. Um, the way that we have seen this model work um, is where the public entity owns the building and leases it to the private entity who owns the business and the inventory, um, which is not by any means a new concept. Um, it can allow for more flexibility in terms. So for instance, it could mean that the municipality has a graduated rent increase so that the business has time to get established before pulling uh, before paying the full market rate on their lease. Um, it also means that the business has access to a variety of funding types. So for example, the public entity, or if it's a nonprofit, would be eligible for a different set of funding resources than a for-profit business. So um, another benefit is long-term buy-in from others in the community. It's not all on the shoulders of the private business owner. Um, the public entity is really partnering with them because they understand that retaining this business, this grocery store, is going to help with the community's appeal for existing residents as well as prospective community members. And then um, it also means that when the existing business owners are ready to retire, um, there is some incentive for the public entity to work with them to find another manager or another business owner. So that can help through the transition process as well. Um, so this store, White's Food Liner, um, in St. John, Kansas, um, it partners with the local Economic Development Corporation. Um, so the Economic Development Corporation is a 501c3, um, and they receive county, they receive funding from the county government. Um, when the Dillons closed in town, the Economic Development Corporation got to work right away trying to attract another grocer to their community. And so they raised funds um, to build a entirely brand new store and they moved it to a different location. 
than where the Dillons had been because um, that new location had higher traffic. Um, it's just a better location altogether. Um, and they currently own and maintain this building. And so this was really important for attracting this grocery store to St. John. White's Food Liner is a small chain in Kansas. They have, I think, five or six grocery stores in the state. Um, and I think it's pretty safe to say that if it weren't for this partnership, they wouldn't probably be in St. John today. Um, so that was an important partnership there. Um, another example is Garden of Eden in Little River, Kansas. And so this building, it's a historic building, over a hundred years old, very old appliances. And the owners were really having a hard time making upgrades. So a local banker had this idea for the city to purchase the building and its equi equipment, and then have the grocery store owners lease the building back from the city. So this meant that the responsibility of maintaining the building, maintaining the equipment, that was now the city's responsibility um, rather than the individual business owners. So once that transition happened, the city applied for a grant from the local community foundation um, and they were able to do all of those renovations that were needed at the store, um, which also meant that the, um, their utility bills also significantly dropped. Um, and again, with this, with this partnership, um, this is gonna help with future business transitions. So we actually wrote a success story about this particular store. Um, and in that story, one of the owners is quoted as saying that um, when we retire, a younger person will be able to afford to own a grocery store without the financial burden of buying the building and repair costs of equipment. So that's going to make a transition smoother down the road. Um, the municipally owned model um, is where the municipal government, whether that's a city or a county, is a key player in the grocery store. They are going to own the property, the building, the business, the inventory, everything about the grocery store is owned by the municipality. Um, and we actually have three examples of these in Kansas. So in this model, the grocery store is essentially being treated like a utility, just like water or electricity. So it is, you know, it's essentially considered a public good for these communities. Um, so there's long-term buy-in from municipal leadership for the grocery store, keeping that grocery store in town. Um, the employees are considered municipal employees. So that means that they also are receiving benefits like health insurance and retirement that helps to attract and retain employees. Um, and then again, with this model, there is less pressure for them to be making a profit. They really wanna cover their expenses. Um, a key difference with this model is that um, the grocery budget is housed within the municipal budget. Um, so here's an example in Erie Market. So the owner of Stubbs Market was ready to retire. They were having a really hard time finding a buyer. So they approached the city of Erie and asked if the city would be interested in purchasing the grocery store. So the city went ahead and they held town halls to gather community input. Um, they, they created a citizen-led committee to do research. Um, they conducted a financial review, reviewed projections, and after doing all of that, they believed that the store would be able to support itself without additional funds from taxpayers. So um, before moving ahead with that transition, they also conducted a survey with the community. They distributed the survey in utility bills, and based on that, 
you know, they saw that there was overwhelming support from the community for the city to purchase the grocery store. Um, so that transition happened in 2021. Um, the next um, city-owned grocery store that I'll talk about today is St. Paul Supermarket. Um, basically, this store was already functioning as a public-private partnership. In 2013, the owners of that grocery store wanted to retire, so the city just decided to purchase the entire store. They hired a couple in town to manage the store, um, and that was back in 2013 that the transition happened. So it's been about 10 years since it's been a city-owned grocery store. Um, and the city approves um, an annual budget uh, for the grocery store every year. So I do see a, a hand raised, so I'll pause there. If you wanna go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I know that you're trying to be an objective researcher, but I feel like I'm, I suddenly, when you were talking about the municipal grocery stores, which I've never heard of before, um, I realized I don't know how they came about and why, other than I know what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, um, Erica, about the meetings and the process, I understood that as an organizer, the steps that you said, but um, maybe I'm the only one online, but a municipally owned grocery store was a new idea to me that I needed to understand that, what you're talking about. I know what you're saying, but how did it come up? And then I started thinking about your actual project that you're talking about. I realized, wow, there's a lot of unusual grocery stores in Kansas. Yes, and you're, <laughs> and you're walking through them almost like it was not atypical. And I work in West Virginia, um, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and I start looking and listening to what you're saying. I'm like, wait, maybe I need to understand why. Wow, what's going on in Kansas? <laughs> what are you talking I think about? That um, I think it's really a matter of we've exhausted other options and we need to figure figure out a new model that works for ourselves um, in our own community if we're not able to find a, another person to step up to be a sole independent private business owner. Um, and so, yeah, I honestly- like Meaning that you exhausted models, other models, meaning that maybe it's not like a, even a kind of neighborhoods that are, um, like 30 miles is typical for us to drive one way to get to a grocery store, but mm. maybe you can't even drive 30 miles to get to Walmart Supercenter. Is that what you're saying? They wouldn't even have that option. Not necessarily. Um, I would say, you know, some of these communities would still need to drive 15, 20 miles to get to a grocery store, maybe 30 miles as well. So it sounds pretty in line with um, the distance that people are driving there in West Virginia as well. Um, but I think it's just a matter of these community members wanted to find a way to open a grocery store and mm -hmm. we're just looking at options. And, you know, honestly, we keep getting surprised by what people are coming up with. So for example, there's a store, or there's a community in Kansas that wants to open a grocery store. Um, the, what they're looking at doing right now is the combination of models that I've talked about here. Essentially, there's um, maybe some space that the city has that they could use. They're very interested in having a very close relationship with the school and having students involved with their entrepreneurship class and ag class. Um, and then they're also interested in it being a cooperative. So they're basically like creating something on their own <laughs> right now that we haven't seen before. So we keep getting surprised as well by what communities are coming up with. I don't know if that's answering your question, <laughs> but... Yeah, um, at least you're surprised too. I, I was yeah. hoping that that's what I was asking. Yeah. 
yeah. in a municipal grocery store. That, is that common around the country or is that particular to Kansas? I would not say that it's necessarily common, although it is interesting that we have three here in Kansas um, because I haven't heard of too many others. But if other people on the call know of others, please chime in. I know that there's one in Baldwin, Florida. Um, I believe I've heard of one maybe in Oklahoma, but it's just kind of scattered here and there. So, Thanks. yeah. And I will also say that a lot of these communities will, as they should, do their research and visit other stores. And this is what's, maybe this is what's near them. So they're gonna visit the municipally owned grocery store. They know people in that community to talk to. And so it just makes it a little bit easier for them to adopt that model if they've already seen it in the state of Kansas. So good questions. Um, so that's the municipal model. And of course, I wanted to throw in cooperatives as well, because that's another really important community supported grocery ownership model. I wasn't planning on digging into it today, since I know that the rest of FCI Live is very much focused on the cooperative model. And so Food Co-op Initiative has you covered <laughs> there. Um, but obviously, there are so many benefits to having um, cooperatively owned grocery stores, not just what we have on the slide here, but retaining community health, supporting other local businesses in town, you know, commitment to education, so much more. Um, we have several examples in Kansas, um, although I will say that the statute in Kansas is not all that favorable to cooperatives. So often what we see is um, there's a co-op grocery store that is maybe um, legally structured as an LLC or a C-Corp or something, um, but it's operating on a cooperative basis. So it's written into the bylaws that were democratically controlled and patronage is distributed based on use and all of that. Um, and again, that's lar largely just because of the way that statute is written here in Kansas, it makes it difficult. Um, but we do know of a cooperative in Kiowa, Kansas, that is legally structured as a true cooperative, um, which I just recently learned about <laughs> this year. I can't believe I didn't know about it before. Um, they are celebrating their 80th anniversary this year, so awesome very exciting um but anyway i didn't want to go too far into this again um i'm sure this is a model that a lot of folks on the call are probably already very familiar with so um i did however want to just mention one other innovation quickly the purchasing cooperative um as I said earlier today, um, a lot of rural grocers have a challenge meeting minimum buying requirements from their wholesaler. So um, what we're seeing is grocers coming together and forming a cooperative to buy products together. And so here on this slide, this is an example of the RAD co-op in North Dakota and how they operate, like the, uh, the system that they use um, where they have a central hub, which is, I think you can see it on the map here, Park River, um, gets products from the wholesaler and then distributes to the other grocery stores that are part of that cooperative. Um, so it enables those stores that are part of the cooperative to buy, um, a larger volume of goods and get better wholesale pricing, um, greater selection of, of goods, um, and that helps them remain competitive. So we are actually exploring this model in Kansas as well with uh, a group in Southeast Kansas. So if you wanna look at this model some more, I highly recommend checking out the RAD Co-op because they're doing some awesome work. All right. 
So I think we have five minutes left. I'm amazed. I wasn't sure I'd be able to do all of that in an hour. Um, but yeah, if we have any time or any additional questions, we have a little bit of time, I think, for a couple more. And I'm I just threw this here on this slide to ask, you know, if you all think any of these models or any of these partnerships might fit within your own context, or if you, you know, a lot of these models require partnership, um, creating partnerships. So if you have any suggestions, any, you know, from your own experience, what has worked well with creating partnerships, um, I think we'll just, we have a couple minutes to share if you want. There was a question. Um... Are there any rural food stores that combine the nonprofit and co-op models that you've seen? Well, um, yes, I guess so, because a lot of the co-ops are kind of, um, you know, more mission driven, I would say. And they, uh, at least in Kansas, I don't know if this is common, they are structured as not-for-profits. Um, so um, I would say I would say that they are kind of operating similarly in that way. Okay. I don't know, JQ, if you have any additional insight into that. Well, like you said, there's a lot of states in which you actually have to be a co-op under the nonprofit statute. What we're starting to see that's intriguing, and we'll see how it bears out, is that there are folks opening cooperative grocery stores in communities that have are low access, low low resource, um, that are actually have a nonprofit arm or forming a nonprofit arm that is planning to fill budget gaps annually with charitable donation. Um, that it basically is impossible to make a fiscally sustainable store, but the community needs access, so they're creating a nonprofit cooperative blend. Uh, I know of one in South Carolina and that is open and several others that are looking at it. So we're starting to see some experimentation with that in a bigger level. Nice, did not know that. <laughs> like you said, innovation's showing up like on a weekly basis <laughs> right now. <laughs> Any last question before we wrap up here? I have a quick question, if I may. Um, Erica, some of the pictures that I saw from your stores, and I know I didn't see the whole store, looked like a lot of conventional food. You know, mm. you had a big stack of Mountain Dew and Jolly Rancher candy and stuff like that. Doing anything with natural and organic in any of these stores? A lot of these stores are um, really are not. Um, they are primarily, I would say, um, selling conventional food items. Um, they're not so much um, driven by providing organic or natural foods. Um, they're really just focused on how do we get any, <laughs> like any kind of food into our community um, is what they're, is what they're after. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. So we're done at the top of the hour, but, um, and if anyone has any last questions they wanna ask right after we wrap up, I'm sure we can we can stick around for those. But I did want to thank Erica so much from the Rural Grocery Initiative for coming and sharing all of this knowledge, all of this experience with us about what is going on with rural grocery, especially in Kansas, but across the country. And just how exciting and innovating everything they're coming up with is when a lot of folks thought that by now the independent grocery would not be able to thrive and finding new ways to thrive. So thank you so much to Erica for joining us and sharing with us about what's going on. I wanted to just share coming up in the series, we still have tonight our Pro Forma 101 for Startup Boards, which is going to be a very accessible look uh, for those who are not used to working with Pro Formas, but are on boards of startup food co-ops into how to understand the Pro Forma of your startup, because it's part of your responsibilities um, and in a way that is not intimidating. So I hope you'll join us for that. Tomorrow, we take a big pivot and we'll be talking about the point of sale system, one of the most important purchases your co-op will make, often a decision that has to be made before the GM arrives. And we'll be talking with Aaron Chase from ECRS all about how to choose a system, what to expect from that experience. And then we are having a terrific case study tomorrow evening with Fertile Ground Food Co-op out of Raleigh, North Carolina. They 
for years couldn't find a system of communication and organizing board documents that they could all buy into and worked and they're going to tell their case study of finally biting the bullet finding a system that works and making it work for them how they've gotten it so they've all on board to it and are using it in a way that is really working for them hopefully there'll be a lot of things you can take away from that um, and about their experience so we've got all of that coming up tonight and tomorrow and we've been we've got a few things happening on thursday still and before we wrap up and thank you again to our sponsors of the summer uh, the summer 2023 fci live series we could not have done it without them